Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cosy. Pick a book, your favourite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they-them pronouns, and I am another love triangle that could be solved with Polly. I'm Soren, I use he-him pronouns, and I am a veiled reference to Twilight. We've been friends for over a decade and are always swapping books. Each fortnight, we take it in turns to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. This month, we're reading Dark Academia. So today, let's get to talking about... Legendborn by Tracy Dion. Morgan, you have chosen for us Legendborn as our second Dark Academia read. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. How did you find out about this book? I... Honestly, I'm not sure. There were a lot of different avenues to me reading this book. I think some of them were TikTok going insane over it. Some of it was just me seeing it and being like, that's a really pretty book and buying it. And then I finally read it when we did it for the YA book group at my local Waterstones. And it was really good. And I devoured it. Despite the fact that the text is tiny and it's still almost 500 pages, And then the sequel, which I haven't yet read, but it's over 500 pages with the same text. If you properly like counted the words, this would be like Game of Thrones. I genuinely think because it's a YA book, they've got to keep it less intimidating. It's 150,000 words. And apparently typical YA fantasy is 100,000, which makes sense. Bruh, it's big. Uh, Game of Thrones book one is 298,000 words, apparently. So not quite that long, but still. It's chunky for a YA book, especially. Legendborn is about a girl who is grieving her mum and goes to definitely not uni. It's actually a college, but it's uni. And then (laughs) discovers that the Arthurian knights are real and that one of them's really hot. And also maybe they are the reason that her mother is dead. So she decides to infiltrate them. But then she finds out she has this other kind of magic. There's multiple magic. And she's like at the crux of both of them. It's about her trying to figure out who she is in this new changing environment. It got me so hard. I cried multiple times. I feel like this is going to be a pretty unhinged episode. Shall we hear my unhinged blind? I am so ready for your unhinged blind. Morgan's Legendborn pitch was, imagine if instead of all of the YA books modelling themselves after those by Shu who must not be named for 10 years, imagine if it had been Percy Jackson instead. So that's a very exciting pitch. It kind of doesn't really give me a lot to go on. I'm wondering if the magic system has something to do with being descendants from mythological beings or figures, and that's how the protagonists have their magic. I know that there is magic, I know that it's fantasy, I believe it's second world fantasy. I think it has a love triangle, maybe? I don't know if that's true. I might just be stereotyping it because it's YA. Is there anything else I know about it? I know that the protagonist loses her mother, and I think that's part of her driving motivation. And I've been told that that's handled very well, so I'm excited about that. Do I have any wild predictions? Um, She has two types of magic on the cover, it looks like. One of them seems like more fiery, and one of them seems more like lightning. So I think that that's going to be the thing that's special about the protagonist, is that usually you only have one element or form of magic, and she's got the two. And maybe that's why she's legendborn, whatever that is. Okay, two types of magic. I forgot that I said that. <laughs> so I guess I'm a genius, actually. We are learning to infer things from these covers. We are. I feel like I actually am getting better at analyzing covers by doing this series. Because <laughs> we're not allowed to read the blurbs, it's all we've got to go on. And the love triangle, which I feel is not stereotyping because all of the kids who were reading Twilight and all of the wide love triangles when they were teenagers are now growing up and writing books and they're all going, you know what would be really fun? A love triangle. I forgot that that was my pitch about Percy Jackson. When I reread this, I had just reread The Lightning Thief. Mm. And there were certain beats where I was like, this is almost one to one. Also, I have to say, as soon as I started reading it, I was like, oh, I totally remember Morgan telling me that this is Arthuriana, just so people know where I was at. There were some really deep cuts of mythology in here. Because mm. I've done a lot more deep diving into Arthuriana since I last read this book. And I really hope that we get like way more mythology deep dives in the second and third book. Shall we talk about the covers? Oh my god. To be fair, I should have inferred from the cover that it's not a second world fantasy because that's a very modern tank top. But the lighting, gorgeous. It's reminiscent of police car lights. Mm. The shadow of that night that haunts her throughout the book. I had not spotted that. I only just realised that. That's fantastic. 
but then the lighting is just so cool and it's so swishy. This is the only time I'd be like, yeah, it's okay to have people on the cover because this is just beautiful. Yeah. And to be fair, I do think there is something to be said for the fact that obviously we've maligned people on covers before. I think what we've also maligned is the same type of protagonist on every cover. Whereas this is a book that some kid will see and go, oh, that looks like me. That's a very different thing. It's deliberately signposting itself as having that representation. And even like just reading it out and about, I saw people giving it a double take and being like, oh, that looks cool. I noticed that because I was reading this in London and I noticed people doing that as well. I'm going to bring up the second cover as well because it matches so beautifully. I love them together. I will say Brie looks so much older on the second. I don't know if there's a time scale. I don't think there is. I definitely prefer the first cover because I'm also like Cell. He's not given quite as hot as I wanted him to give, you know, in terms of like the <laughs> way that Brie describes him. What did you want from him, Morgan? I don't know. Just It's giving Justin Bieber with the haircut. You're right. It's the hair. I'm not a fan either. And I can't talk because I basically had Justin Bieber hair when I was like 12. <laughs> But I do like the armour that she's wearing. It's very cool. The armour is extremely cool. And also the sword. We love a good sword in this house. The one issue I do have with this cover, the singular issue, is this gem in the O. Oh, you're so right. I completely agree. Why does it look like it's been photoshopped in the last minute? Just let the artist draw that bit too, please. I guess someone else might have done the text. Other than that, stunning, show-stopping, spectacular. First off, this book, half of my brain is on the world and the story because it's so beautiful and so interesting. And the other half is just making notes, being like, this just feels like a masterclass in how to write a YA book. The pacing and the character interactions and just the way that she writes itches something in my brain and I don't know what it is, but it's just so beat for beat perfect in the way that it's structured. There are a couple of issues I do have. I have to admit, I didn't love the pacing. I felt like the pacing was something that shot it in the foot sometimes in terms of high octane action and then suddenly grinding to a stop. And I mean, I'll get into that later, but certain character dynamics didn't care as much about them as others, <laughs> which made it difficult for me to come back to reading it if I had happened to put it down at that kind of moment. Mm. There was a brief period where it took me like three days because I was just like, I don't care about the scene. <laughs> But also, when people talk about pacing, they mean the writing. I think the pacing of the writing was generally good, but the pacing of the actual like plot in terms of the fact that this all happened within the space of a week was driving me crazy. I don't mean that pacing. That pacing was like, if you've set up that this could be over six weeks, let it be over six weeks, let it breathe. But the technical writing rather than the plot pacing, I think is what I mean by pacing. I feel like there were elements that I liked. I felt like her dialogue was great, but problems with some of the action scenes for me. Sometimes I was just like... I don't know what's happening. You actually try and imagine the fight. You don't just kind of go like, yeah, these things happen. I never visualize fight scenes. And I think that helps me so much. Yeah, you're just like, okay, they fight, they fight, who won? They're fighting, okay. And then I'm like, wait, how did they get over here? What? Who? Who's dead? What? And then I have to go back like five pages. Fair. But it's never let me down in terms of enjoying a book more. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> but the dialogue is so like... We come from an audio drama background, so we are very used to very real dialogue, I want to say. And I feel like we've incorporated that into our writing a lot. And it feels like this is very genuine human speech. Completely. They're speaking with real people voices rather than like storybook voices. Yeah. The other thing I felt was that it was very Gen Z. This is how some kid on TikTok would be talking. When there was slang, it was used correctly. Shocking. You're mentioned earlier about the veiled reference to Twilight. Yeah. Anybody who doesn't get it won't get it, but you know instantly, like the moment she's like, put me on your back, you're like, oh my god, are you gonna say Spider Monkey? Obsessed with the implication of Cell watching Twilight because he immediately went like that movie. So when did he do it? <laughs> Tor's just like, sit down. You're so right. That's exactly when it happened. And I feel like it was a situation as well where Tor was doing it because she was in love with Kristen Stewart. <laughs> she hadn't realised that. <laughs> yes. She's like sobbing into her popcorn and he's like, what? And then he gets to the, <laughs> the baseball scene. He's like, oh, I get it now. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just really, really enjoy the writing style. I did love the fact that she used a free verse poetic form towards the end. Yes. We love a good mixy mixy vibe. We're experimental. We're going to do other things. This is so cool. We said this in, in The Watchful City that we wanted more poetry in largely prose books. Mm. Especially when you've got fantastical elements. How else are you going to capture it? I mean, you can just capture it with prose. That's fine. And if you do a good job, then I'm not saying that that's bad. But there's something about the rhythm of poetry, especially for a memory, which just makes sense. Especially, I think, for this kind of memory where it's about a legacy that has been erased, where the only thing that you have is spoken word, is stories passed down. Yeah. Poetry is such a ritual mm. form of storytelling. Exactly. It just makes sense. 
And it was so good. It was so good. Soren, who was your favourite character and why was it Selwyn Kane? I'm not sure if it is, quite genuinely. Okay. He was getting on my nerves like crazy to begin with, at least. Please, we get it. You're very dark and tortured. I understand. <laughs> it was towards the end when I started to like him, and it was when Bree was sort of getting to know him, mm. seeing his little highlighters strewn all over his books and was in his room and was like, okay, this is like a guy. This is just some guy. On my first read, he really annoyed me. <laughs> and then on my second read, because you know that all of his motives are my life is in danger. If I am considered untrustworthy, I will be kicked out. And then I will go insane and lose my mind. When you know that that's his motivation the whole time, you're like, okay, I can understand yeah. why he's broody. <laughs> Who's like genuinely out to get Brie. You can give him a little grace. To be fair, I wasn't annoyed that he was genuinely out to get Brie. This sounds terrible. <laughs> I think it was just the extreme tropiness, particularly when put in opposition to Nick, the golden boy and the dark hat. We get it. Oh, I loved that. I was so surprised and delighted to be proven right about the romantic undertones between Nick and Sel's relationship, because I was picking up on that from the beginning, but I thought I was just being me and reading into things. I thought, this is a mainstream YA novel, there are queer characters, but they'll be relegated to the background. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I was so happy <laughs> and so shocked. The homoeroticness. Yeah. It's just so there from the get-go. And Bree's just there like, do you need a room? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> so Gideon the Ninth Corps. In the, I am inherently tied to you as your bodyguard, but I hate you, but I have to protect you. Exactly. The Scion-Squire relationship was just undeniably necromancer-cavalier-coded as well. I was loving that. A magical co-defendant relationship. That's all I want, apparently, when I pick up fantasy. I didn't realise that, I guess, until we started doing this show, but, you know, we're all here to learn things about ourselves. And it doesn't have to be romantic, it can be platonic, which we love here. There's different mm -hmm. permutations of it. It's just so good. I kind of wish we would dug into it more here. I was a little bit disappointed, because I feel like a lot of the interesting things that could have happened were just sort of breezed over. Like, William was mm -hmm. like, wow, it's so messed up if you break up. That's why I would never date my squire. And it's like, okay. But how much more fun would it have been if there was a couple in the background here who had broken up? I mean, I don't think Tor and Sarah will last the next book, to be perfectly honest, considering Tor's moment at the end where she's like, yes, I'm going to be racist here. Yeah. I feel like them, their days are numbered. I mean, she was low-key racist the whole time, to be fair. But... Oh, yeah, no. But I feel like that not bowing to Brie was like, mm, maybe this is it. Yeah. Sarah, you can do so much better. I haven't actually answered the question. <laughs> Maybe it was just Brie. Brie. Brie is a genuinely good main character, considering yeah. she's in first person, which both of us have a little bit of an iffy relationship with. Mm. She drives the narrative. She has good motives for everything. Yeah. She is genuinely reacting in very human ways at all times. Exactly. That is the thing I massively appreciated. I also lost a parent in my teens, and it is something that always comes up in YA. It's often the driving force of the narrative. And... People just don't react at all, really. I was going to say normally, but obviously there's no normal way to react and everyone reacts differently. So that's not what I mean. But when there's just no consideration of it, it's just, it basically just breaks my immersion, to be completely honest. <laughs> I wish it was deeper than that. I'm reading The Third Daughter at the moment by Adrian Tooley. The protagonist lost her mother like three days before the narrative starts. And I appreciate that they're going for the repression thing with her. They're like, she is repressing all of her emotions. That's her whole deal. There has been a couple of times when the narrative has stopped to be like, wow, she hasn't even had time to grieve. And I'm like, yes. But if you are forcing yourself to function, it's going to come out another way. Mm. But with this, the author's note, Dion talked about losing her mother, and her mother losing her mother at a young age, and that legacy being what inspired Legendborn, so I'm not surprised that it's as poignant as it is, but very well done. It overhangs the narrative in the same way it overhangs Brie. One of the best depictions of grief that I've ever seen, possibly, especially in a YA book. I think YA is where it tends to suffer, because I think it's a mix of not wanting to dwell on it, because is this an appropriate subject for children? And also, oh, I just want to jump to the adventure kind of thing. This is just an inciting incident, or this is just a motivation. Yeah. But then it suffers as an inciting incident or a motivation, because it is such a huge thing. If you make it into the small thing, I'm not believing in your characters. Yeah. And I think you can do it skillfully without making it overtly traumatising. I would point to a series of unfortunate events, which I think does grief so beautifully. But it is 9 to 12-ish. Morgan, who was your favourite character? That's a really, really difficult question. We've made some really good points about Brie, and I love her so much. When I first read the book, I really loved Nick, because I thought he was an interesting take on that type of character. And I think I was fresh out of a Merlin rewatch, so I was like, yes, this is exactly what I needed. But then I love Cell, and I feel like we'll get a lot more of his actual personality in book two. 
And I really love the motivations you find out about him because it's quite hard to pull off turning a character around that quickly. Yeah. And his character still makes sense. It's not a sudden 180. Everything Mm -hmm. is still very consistent. It's just now Brie actually understands him and understands him possibly more than anyone else who even knows him because she's actually bothered to take the time. But I think the standout was William. I love him with his forehead sticky notes. I love him so much. (laughs) Maybe it was because you were like, this is kind of like a Percy Jackson book. I could only see Will Solace. His name is Will. He works in the infirmary. He has magical healing powers. He's also gay. I think he's also blonde. Yeah, he is. (laughs) I just love the forehead sticky notes and the way he's like, yeah, I know that Brie is straight up lying about her intentions, but also I am a good enough judge of character to know that she's not spying on us maliciously. So I'm just going to help her and give her all the information she needs. And then he's got this little like bromance with Alice going on on the side at the end. I did love Alice. I kind of wish we'd had a little bit more from Alice in general. One thing that I have to say, I just have to get this off my chest. You're Alice. You're less than a week into your study early thing like we're british we don't do this kind of thing your your early college program thing with your best friend she's just lost her mom she had this argument after you guys got caught at this party it's all very fraught then she comes home covered in mud and blood and she won't tell you what's happened and she's just been hanging out with this new boy nick who was assigned to her by the dean three days later she tells you that she's going out with nick who she's dating now to a bar with his friends No, you're not. You didn't tell me what happened. You came home covered in mud and blood. Your mind immediately goes to some very horrific places there. Especially, like, she's not even going to be blinded by the fact that Nick's hot because she's a lesbian. But also, even in between the, like, original party and the argument, she comes home blackout drunk, in inverted commas. She wasn't. She was just messed up on ether. But as far as Alice is concerned, so drunk that she does not remember the next day what happened. Absolutely not. That completely broke my version. I was like, no, no, no way. I kind of just assumed that to be, like, the cultural difference of, like, American unis. No. Because, like, hazing and initiation and stuff are just like that in the US. I appreciate that, but also if you have to, like, help your friend into the shower and she won't tell you what happened. Mm, Yeah. Alice, go get your girl, please. Where is Alice to be the voice of reason? Because she is in every other context, so it just seemed bizarre that in that context, I'm like, this seems like the most fraught. And the mesmer was right there. Could have just used it. I feel like she wouldn't, though. She wouldn't be like, yes, could you go wipe my best friend's memory? Maybe not, but I feel like she should have at least considered it. Yeah, definitely. If I'm being honest, my issues with Alice, I feel, were a bit symptomatic of some of my issues with the rest of the cast. I liked our leads. Everyone else kind of blurred together a little bit for me. I feel like there were too many of them. We got a bunch of them in the same scene, and that was too much, because also it was the scene where you were basically being info-dumped about like, how the magic system worked and how the mm. legacy system worked. And then they're like, here's all these people. And I was like, that's too many oh, people. Yeah. Even on a second read, I could not tell you how the magic system works entirely. I can't tell you what the difference between a Scion and a Legendborn is, and I've decided it doesn't matter. <laughs> Basically. I don't think there is one. At the beginning of the second book, there's a little... Oh, a graph. We love a graph. ...diagram of the order of importance of people, which really helps, and I feel like we needed this at the end of the first book, rather than the table of, like... Yeah, colour symbolism and stuff. I was like, that's not important. That's not come up that often. I got excited when I saw it. I was like, maybe this will help me, and then I looked at it, and I was like, this is not helping me. Yeah, no, this graph is very useful. It makes a lot more sense. I feel like it was okay and that you could roll with it. But for me, more Mm. egregious was the character thing. Not just confusing characters, but also I felt like some of the background characters were a bit one note, maybe because there were so many of them. But like Vaughn just existed to like be a... And Nick's father existed to also just kind of be like a more subtle... (laughs) I feel like we had the same issue with Hell Followed With Us. And I feel like I'm just like, I assume that it doesn't matter and they're just there for effect to populate the scene. So I just blur past them. And if they're important, they'll be brought up enough that I'll remember them. Or as you're more like, I need to know who the people are. Not even necessarily I need to know who the people are, but of the people that you're bothering to tell me about, I would like them to feel three-dimensional. And for some of these guys, even Will to an extent, which it hurts me to say it, but he felt very gay best friend. I think I was also coming at it from like a, not to compare it to Percy Jackson again, but in that series, you have a lot of extra characters who are just named, but they don't have any personalities. And then they're named enough that when in like book five, they become important, you feel Mm -hmm. connected to them and they don't feel like they're coming out of nowhere. And then they're given a personality. And I very much felt like this book was planting the seeds for those characters to be important later. Yeah. But they didn't necessarily need to have personalities yet because, again, this book is so long. I think that's fair. I would make that argument that things like witty dying was definitely intended to have an emotional effect. And for me, it didn't because I was like, I barely know this. That's the camo one, right? 
the one that wears the camo. I'm just like, yeah, okay, people are dying. This shows that there's costs of war. Yeah, fair. I wasn't really like, um, am I supposed to be crying here? Because I'm not. But I felt like it was supposed to be a fairly emotional moment for Brie. And I was like, it's not it's not hidden for me. And then also in terms of characters like Davis, who are quite important in that they are arguably the antagonist of this. I was like, this man's motivation is paper thin. I appreciate that he's a book one villain. I appreciate that there's definitely an overarching plot line. He's kind of just here so that there can be a denouement at the end of the first book. But he's kind of boring. We're waiting for more gain. Yeah, exactly. I did love that Dion's expertise absolutely shone through here. In terms of this being dark academia, where the author is getting to dig obsessively into a subject that they love, which I feel like is a common (laughs) thread in lots of dark (laughs) academia, this absolutely delivers on that. It's so much fun. Yes. The tidbit about the unworthy in quotation marks descendant of one of the knights at the round table, I was like, I never knew that. That's so interesting. Yes. Or the Arthuriana. The thing about Arthuriana is that basically 90% of the canon is just fan fiction Mm. of tiny tidbits of stories. It's called The Matter of Britain and is basically the closest thing that the UK has to a living oral tradition. It's so cool because there's so many different iterations, which is why there's so many different ways to tell the story. And it's why Merlin is actually canon, technically, because every retelling of Arthurian legend is canon, just like every Greek mythology retelling is canon. And I wrote a whole dissertation about this, and I will fight people. Speaking of this as a retelling, the twist that Brie is the descendant of Arthur, so immaculate. I love subversions of prophecies. I completely didn't see it coming, which I was so excited about. Nick being Lancelot as well. I feel like, Mm. I hope we'll get a lot out of that in the second book. Also, like, as someone who's just read Gwen and Arthur Not in Love, I'm deep in my thruple brain. Okay, we're going to go on to the, we're just segueing onto this. This is the perfect segue, yes. Okay, yes. I am a strong believer in love triangles can often be solved by Polly. I've read a lot of books recently which could have been solved with polyamory. And this book is one of them because this is the first book I've read where it's been so explicitly like, yes, there's multiple angles going on here. And we haven't heard from Nick because he's been kidnapped. But we know that Cell likes both of them. We know that Bree likes both of them. We're just waiting to hear back on Nick. We've got the whole history of Guinevere and Lancelot and Arthur, which makes a lot of sense. And On TikTok, I have seen some people reviewing this book being like, yeah, I don't know whether I'm Team Cell or Team Nick yet. I don't understand why people are saying that Polly will be okay because I don't understand how we're okay with under 18s being in Polly relationships. And that really boils my blood because Polly, just like being queer, is not something that is inherently sexual. It's just another way of living. It is just communication and loving multiple people and being with multiple people, it doesn't have to be sexual. And if it is, teenagers have sex. This is a fact. You know, you have a lot of fade to black scenes in straight books, in queer books. I'm not saying that they have to have like group sex to be together, but they can be emotionally involved with each other. Yeah. They can have fade to black scenes. And that is not inherently any more NSFW than a straight couple doing it. Completely. And I think it should be point. But then I'm also. My cynical brain is like, I Mm -hmm. think that Nick is gearing up to be a villain. Yeah, no, I feel that. And I'm a bit scared, but I'm also like, it would make sense. And it would would follow some trajectories. But I'm also like, let them be Polly, please. I don't want to talk too long about a different property again. But brief segue, Back Again, Back Again by Abigail Eliza also features a prophecy that's subverted with a love interest who thinks that he is the king, quote unquote, and then it's the female lead. I guess this is kind of a spoiler, but like, it's so obvious. It's so obvious, mm-hmm. right? I can say it. Yeah. Cassian, we love you. However. <laughs> no, you were never going to be the king, you little fool. I'm sorry. You were literally the oppressor the whole time, bestie. Where where was the critical thinking? Exactly. And the parallels from that to this, the colonialism themes, makes me think that Nick is going to be irredeemable. Maybe I just don't trust him because he's like a blonde white man. <laughs> I think that that's possible and I'll admit it. I have hope, but I also would not be surprised if he turned out to be a villain in the end. But I would need like a convincing degradation arc because I do love a good falling into villainy arc, but it needs to be convincing. It can't just be, oh, now he's a villain. I trust this author, I think, if she was going to do it, to do it well. I'm on the fence and I could go either way. But currently I'm like, it's Polly or villainy or bust. That's where I'm at. I'm completely on the same page. But I'm also so invested in the friendship between Natasia Kane and Bree's mother. I want more of that. I need all of that. The tiny fragments we got, I was like, this is so compelling. I want to see more. 
Also, still waiting for the line of Morgan to actually turn out to not be as evil as we think they are. I mean, we've already subverted the thing about Merlin's, and there's no way Merlin's actually go nuts and kill everybody. That's something that the Order do to them. That's a great way to control your entire population and force them into oath at a young age and be like, but it's for their own good. Sorry, have to do it. Surely the Morgans are also chill. I bet even some of the easels are chill. I bet they're just minding their own business. They're just minding their own business, getting hunted for sport, and they're like, bro, right in front of my salad? Hello. I did find it kind of funny that they were all just animals. I don't know why. Like, I grew up on Tokyo Mew Mew. It is just mutated animals that they fight, but for some reason. I really, really liked the fox scene. It was so visceral. It was so bloody, especially for a YA book. It does take on that whole Percy Jackson thing of like, they dust so you don't have a body. It's really convenient. But the whole, it doesn't go to dust because her hand is inside it. And there's a little soft moment with yeah. her and Cell, and he's like, you have to just, ah. Oh. I love it. Playing with the rules of that is fun. It's a trope that you see in a lot of things, but taking it to its logical conclusion of, okay, so how does that actually work? But also speaking of soft moments, <laughs> carryad is one of the most common Welsh terms that non-Welsh speaking people know the meaning of. And like, I know she literally goes, I could tell what it meant, but I didn't want to look into it too much because I was too scared of the answer. But also, sell, really? You're going to be that obvious with how you feel? Morgan, I don't know what it means. You have to tell me. You have to tell me live on the podcast. It basically just means like, darling. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. Damn, Sal. Okay. <laughs> also, everyone speaks Welsh, apart from Brie. That's so dangerous, Sal. She could ask anybody. She could be like, what does that mean? He's literally like, you're my king, Cariad. And I'm like, oh, this romance is romancing. But also, you're being so obvious, Bestie. I do love it. And I do love a good fantasy pet name. Even better, I love a pet name when it's in a different language. They've been calling them that that whole time. And then I love that trope. But it's also a really common word. Also, all of the King stuff was so good. I don't know. There's just something about it, you know? The devotion. Alexa playing King by Florence Welch. When it's a woman, specifically. <laughs> I guess it's fine if it's a guy, it's whatever. But when it's a woman. The power imbalance between Cell and Nick, bad vibes. The power imbalance between Cell and Brie currently. Yes. I, I want what they have. I guess it's that thing of like, she's not going to take advantage of it, is she? Whereas Nick does. We need to address this, Nick, please, because you're like, I hate all the systems, but I am also going to repeatedly assert my authority over Cell to the point where I'm going to punch him in the face and he cannot hit me back without dying. Over the line. So over the line. Just because you don't like the system doesn't mean you don't benefit from it. Am I still kind of rooting for a toxic throuple? Yes. I, I feel like they can get over it. I feel like they can communicate. I just want a toxic throuple. <laughs> I just want any throuple, but I'll take a toxic one especially because I just love a good fantasy toxic couple. And if you add another person, it's even better. You only have to wait until Heavenly Torrent comes out to be fair and then you have like a guaranteed toxic throuple. My brain was linking Iron Widow in this at the end because Arthur showing up and being like, I'm going to do this <laughs> was so similar to the Iron Widow dynamic of the main character being like, have this crazy old man who I've brought back from the dead and he's trying to do things and I have no time for his <laughs> I'm the queen now. I did appreciate as well that the fact that the magic system has nuance in terms of where you live, your culture affects the way you conceive of magic and the way you engage with magic. Love it. We've talked to death about how much we like it in The Last Binding, but it's very much only hinted at in The Last Binding. You don't actually get that much of it. You get a lot more of it here. Yeah. It's multiple magic systems using the same source, which is yes, so interesting. Yes, exactly. It's so good. And how the magic system reflects the culture that created it, because you do have the very typical white we're stealing the power we're manipulating it we are not giving back to the land and then you have the more reciprocal ancestral mm. power root as the person who is new to this book final thoughts i had a good time i was struggling in the middle we've kind of touched on it briefly but i will say in words of one syllable that i really just didn't care about the romance at all really i know we've talked about the rough last space <laughs> <laughs> and that's fun because it's subversive and you don't see a lot of it but Brie and Nick, and honestly Brie and Cell, I, I didn't care. I didn't care. And that took me out of it a little bit. And then also the sort of stuff I mentioned about background characters, their motivations weren't very nuanced, personalities in general weren't very nuanced. That took me out of it a little bit. But other than that, oh my god. I mean, I feel like there's things we didn't even really have time to talk about, the way that history was woven in so beautifully. I think that's something that this generation definitely needs in their young adult novels. A really interesting space to be writing in, because in terms of like even 20 years ago, there was a cultural attitude of these aren't things that we talk about it's fantastic that all of these things are coming to the fore 
but it does bring with it generational trauma. It's a difficult experience getting in touch with those parts of your heritage. Absolutely love how that was incorporated. I was kind of like wavering between three and four, and then we found out that Brie was a descendant of Arthur, and it's so nuanced. So this is like a very, very strong four for me. And mm. I'm very excited to read Blood March. Morgan, give us your final thoughts. This revitalized me so much when I first read it. It felt like the YA books that I was reading were missing every time I tried. And I sort of was like, maybe YA is not for me anymore. Maybe I'm going to give up on it. And then I read this book and it just had everything. And it's just so nuanced and so full of everything you could ever want. It's doing so many things and it's somehow succeeding at all of them mostly. The pacing is definitely more fit for a TV show and I would be absolutely obsessed to see a TV show of this. This book is something that is so special and I'm so glad that teenagers can read it. And Tracy Dion I think is going to be an instant buy author for me from Mm. here on because I trust her with my entire soul. Five stars. I need the third book. How long is this series? It just says series on the back. Is that a trilogy? It just says it was planned as a trilogy on her website. That's such like a non-answer. How many books are there going to be? It was planned as a trilogy. Love that, very diplomatic. There's no updates on the third book on this website. Please. (laughs) Okay, Morgan, if anyone is also in agony waiting for the third book, (laughs) what would you recommend they read in the meantime? So... First off, I'm going to recommend Rapunzella or Don't Touch My Hair by Ella McLeod. Oh, I've been meaning to read that. Which is a novel told half in prose and half in verse. And it is about this girl, her neighbourhood is being gentrified and she's trying to exist in this very posh white school as a black girl. And also she has dreams of this magical land where an evil Prince Charming magically straightened all women's hair because magic is kept in the hair when it's like curly it's just so metaphorical and interesting and uses fairy tales in such an interesting way it was just such a lyrical book it connects with a lot of the themes that legendborn does motherhood and sisterhood black identity and it was Oh, it was really good. So I'm going to recommend that. And then for the Arthuriana Rex, because you know I got you for those. I'm going to start off with one of my favourite Arthuriana retellings so far. Morgan is My Name by Sophie Keach. I kept seeing it and being like, I'm not going to read that just because it's called Morgan is My Name. I'm actually actively avoiding it because of that title. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to try it. I'm in the mood. I'll just read it. I read it at the end of December and it was one of my favourite books of that month because it was just such an interesting retelling, which was clearly so well researched and had so much history going on, and so much feminist retelling, but not in like a 21st century hashtag feminism way. The main character is a woman. She just wants to learn anatomy. She literally just wants to be a healer, and people are like, no. And then she ends up in a convent, and her best friend's a lesbian. She's also Morgana, and she's learning magic, and she's really cool. And it was just such an interesting take on the myth, and it was still sympathetic to Arthur and to England in such an interesting way. It's going to be a trilogy, I think. And they cannot wait to see how that develops because we only got up to Arthur being crowned king. Oh, right. So it's very early into the myth. I'm very excited to see where that goes. And I would recommend the audiobook if you can listen to it because it's so well voiced. And then, because I have to mention it, The Once and Future Duology by A.R. Capetta and Corey McCarthy. I've seen a lot of valid criticism of both of these books. It is the most unhinged, most Riverdale retelling of... (laughs) mythology you could ever find it's set in space but it's still fantasy and it's very YA and the space honestly is half the draw because it's so interesting to see that side of a retelling I feel like people haven't really gone there with that once in future it does the whole rebirth cycle so interestingly for Arthuriana and it's so gay like it's just so queer another female Arthur which is great brown female Arthur yeah and lesbians and Merlin is gay and yeah. Lamarack is gay. There's non-binary people going on and it's like colonialism but also capitalism and there's some weird pregnancy plotline going on and there's Renfair and it's like such a fever dream of a book. I feel like if you want to check it out, you want to check it out for a ride rather than for the pinnacle of literature. But that's fine sometimes. So yeah, retellings are my jam. What are your recommendations? Okay, I'm actually doing a non-book recommendation as well. So I'm going to start with that. I haven't read the comics, but Cursed, the Netflix show. Oh yeah. Which got cancelled after a season. But it also has a Black Arthur and it's just a very fun reimagining. Caveat, 
There's only one season and it was kind of all set up. The book is also very interesting. It also mostly feels like setup, and I don't remember what happened at the end, but Nimue as a character was very interesting in terms of discussing the corruption of power. And I just love a good unhinged female main character. And I really loved the TV show because it had the guy who plays Isaac Leahy as like a really interesting morally grey character. And it had Gay Morgana. I am a simple man. I see Gay Morgana and I must stand. The other thing that I was going to recommend is not young adult. And it's also extremely well known, but I'm just going to toss it out there. Babel by R.F. Kuang. If you want magic mm. that is tied to colonialism and is being used as a vehicle to explore colonialism, and you also want dark academia because it's undoubtedly that, and you want lead characters of color, and it is as good as everyone says it is. And I know it's very long, and if you're like a young adult person, you might be looking at it and being like, it's too long. If you did Legend Ball, I believe you can do Babel. They're actually probably the same length, it's just the font sizes. Look at the length of the audiobook and then we'll find out. Editing Soren here. I was curious, so I looked this up. And according to how long to read, there's only 20,000 words in it and about three hours difference between the audiobooks. So genuinely not very much difference between the length of Legendborn and the length of Babel. Next time, it's Spooky Month. It is finally Halloween. It's not Halloween, it'll be like the beginning of October. But it will be Halloween at the end of the month and therefore we're reading scary books. And I'm starting us off with Pet by Akweke Amazi. And I don't want to say anything about it at all because I don't think Morgan knows anything about it. Am I correct? I've seen the cover occasionally. I own a copy. That is as far as I can say. I shall not say a single word. That will be out on October 9th. Until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to squish the cat on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Planar Prod. On this episode, you heard Morgan Greensmith and Soren Brywood discussing Legendborn by Tracy Dion. You can find out more about this book at tracydion.com, and you can follow Dion on Twitter at Tracy Dion. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase, and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Playing Our Prod at playingourprod.com. Know what we should read next, or want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com, send us a DM on social media, or join our growing community of bookworms on our Discord server. The link is in the show notes. Want to support The Hidden Bookcase? Support us on Patreon for bonus episodes every month, outtakes, playlists, and other extras. Or consider leaving us a rating or review, or telling a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for new bookworms to discover our show. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 9th of October, we'll be discussing Pet by Akwake Amazi. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through the bookcase.